Well, good morning, Harvest Fresno. It's good to see everyone here uh, this morning. Let's go ahead, come on in, have a seat and get ready for our announcements. My name is Carlos. Um, I'm going to be sharing some announcements uh, with you uh, this morning. It's an, uh, just a pleasure to be back here, and it's good to see that we all survived the hurricane uh, last night. So... Um, a special welcome to our visitors. If you're visiting us here for the first time, we just want to welcome you to Harvest Fresno. We are so glad that you are here with us. And if you haven't checked in with us, you're new, haven't checked in, uh, we invite you to text the word welcome to the number 559-245-6200. And it's just a way for you to start uh, just some interactions with the church, a way for us to connect with you. So if you wouldn't mind texting welcome to that number, uh, 245-6200, uh, we'd love to connect with you. And then also we have our friendship registers. They're at the end of the aisle. So um, I'm going to ask Abigail if you can hold that up, the friendship register just there. That's what they look like. Uh, it's also a way for you to let us know that you are here um, with us. Just give us some contact information. Again, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, and if you are new, if you want to take that slip of paper after service, take it to the back table. We would also love to give you a, a share a gift with you um, as well. Uh, and if you have any prayer requests, they're at the bottom of our friendship register. You can let us know how we can pray for you as a church. And if it's a confidential or a private prayer, you can mark private, and just the elders of the church will uh, lift that up to, to the Lord along with you. So make sure to do that. And then once you're done, you can keep on passing it down the aisle there. So we also have baptisms and child dedications that are coming up. So that's going to be on Sunday, September 17th. So if you are interested in either being baptized or having a child dedicated, you can email church at harvestfresno.org for more information on that process. Again, that's church at harvestfresno.org. And then lastly, there was very many announcements this morning. Uh, the last thing we have for you is if you are not getting uh, information about our announcements and you would like to, you can be added to our weekly email list. Or if you have any questions about anything that's announced here uh, today or about the church in general, you can email church at harvestfresno.org. So church at harvestfresno.org. And then you'll be added to the email list and get any questions that you have answered for you. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and take a moment right now to greet each other. Uh, so take some time, say hello to somebody that you haven't seen, and show them that harvest love. All right, church. Let's go ahead now with our call to worship. Um, we're going to go with Psalm chapter, or ch chapter on 105, verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Arise, for the light has come. Darkness bows down to the risen sun, the risen sun. Arise, raise your hands.
in the house of the Lord, and it is good to clap and sing together. Thank you so much for joining us. There is a light that burns in the darkness. I 
worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you always. And I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you. King, you have done everything on our behalf, everything that we could even imagine and comprehend far beyond that. We recognize that you are our light and you are our guide and you are our king. And in your presence, we submit to you today, asking that you speak to us through pastor, letting this be a time that guides us and leads us 
closer to you. We love you and we thank you in your holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning, church. Whoa, hello. <laughs> Good morning. Sure that woke you up. We are so blessed to be here this morning and uh, being able to wake up in our right minds and worship the one true God. So grateful for that great privilege. Uh, if you are new, we want to welcome you again and uh, thank you for visiting with us. And uh, those online, uh, welcome as we worship the Lord together. Uh, we say here that um, we are a hospital, that uh, no one is well, no one has arrived. Uh, we are all in uh, phases of getting better, and um, that's what we believe, that's what we teach, that's how we live out our life here at Harvest Fresno. So um, uh, if you are sick and need to be well, then welcome. You're not alone, and uh, we are here together to grow in the grace of the knowledge of the Lord. Let's uh, go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to gather together, again, knowing that it's only because you first loved us and uh, revealed your Son to us in a way that we can know him and uh, worship him. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, you would decrease me so that you would increase and that your words would penetrate our hearts, Lord, and encourage those that need encouragement. Uh, bring conviction where conviction is needed, but ultimately, Lord, our desire is to be transformed. Our desire is to uh, not remain the same. It's to be conformed into the image of your Son uh, for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Right now, during the summer months, we are experiencing, you know, prolonged times of sunshine. It's, it's daylight longer in the summer than it is in the winter. And uh, in the change in the winter, of course, the nights are much shorter, especially if you travel to the north, right? In Alaska, the days are uh, much shorter, the nights are much longer in Scandinavian countries. And that brings about a certain sadness. Seasonal affective disorder. It's a, it's a known situation where people actually in those areas that experience prolonged darkness, they experience uh, greater depression. Uh, there's uh, changes in their appetite and, um, and sleep patterns. And again, it's, it's common in those areas that experience those long nights. But there's actually an even more common form of sadness that is common to man, and that is sinful affective disorder. And that is a result of living in spiritual darkness. And this is a topic that we find our Lord talking about as we um, approach the passage of Scripture that we are that we've landed on this morning as we go through our verse-by-verse -verse sermon series in the Gospel of John. But the consequences of spiritual sadness is far worse than the seasonal affective disorder. The, the consequences are, are quite drastic and can even lead to death. So it's something that we want to be aware of and um, before we dig in, let's uh, kind of set the table and remember where we have been. Um, if we take the, what we talked about last week about Jesus uh, encountering the woman that was brought to him, the adulterous woman, and understand that that was an insertion in this text and didn't, didn't necessarily fit a chronological order for the text, then what we find is that this is still where Jesus is at the Feast of the Tabernacles, where he showed up and started teaching. And this is where he talked about being the living water, right? So the Feast of the Tabernacles was one of the big three feasts of the, of the Jews that they celebrated, and it was their favorite one. 
This was uh, one that, where they uh, celebrated the gracious provision of, the, of God during their time wandering in the desert for 40 years. And so this was a big celebration, and people set up uh, tents uh, in um, commemoration of them living in temporary shelter during that time. But it was basically like this big camping trip. And the kids loved this uh, situation that existed in the, um, during this time, during the Feast of the Tabernacles. They would visit each other. And they have these three main themes going on. The, the tabernacle, which of course represented God residing, being present with, with um, Israel. Uh, we even remember in John chapter 1, verse 14, where it said, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen the glory of the uh, as the uh, Son of the Father. And that word for dwelt, as we talked about way back when, means tabernacle. That Jesus actually tabernacled with the people through the incarnation. And then we also have a theme of water. And water was, again, representative of God's gracious provision of providing water in the desert when there was no water. And the third theme was light. And that light represented God presenting himself as a, as a pillar of cloud during the uh, uh, day and a pillar of fire uh, by night. And it was light, again, representing his guidance, his, his direction, and his presence with him. And what we find in the Feast of the Tabernacle, as Jesus is teaching, he's saying he's the fulfillment of all of those things, of the tabernacle, of water. He, when he said that, again, that he was the living water, and if you drank from him, uh, you, would never, you would never thirst. And there was a whole ritual with that water where the uh, priest would take water uh, from the uh, pool of Siloam, and they'd take the pitchers, and they poured. It was a big ritual, and it was at that point where Jesus said, no, I, I'm the living water. And <clears throat> if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and whoever believes in me, uh, out of his heart flows living water. So that was, again, Jesus fulfilling that. But at the same ceremony, in the same time, the Feast of uh, the Tabernacles, there was a big celebration with lights. There were these, these huge four uh, uh, candle op uh, operas that were 40 feet tall, and they lit those. And the, the people had little torches, and they danced, and they sang for this, uh, again, remembering uh, God being with them, and this was a great celebration. And this is where even the orchestras uh, cut loose and the, you had these uh, dignified leaders. They would just dance. And it was, again, a joyous celebration. And again, we learned from before that this was now coming at the, the last day of the feast. And this is when the lights would be extinguished. And it is at that point that Jesus stands up and he says, I am the light of the world. So that's the context where we hear this uh, passage from, from Jesus interacting with the religious leaders who are trying to trap him, who are trying to, who wanted to get rid of him. And so that is what we're going to be looking at, what it means to walk in the light of Christ. Walking in the light of Christ. The first we have to understand is Jesus is the source. The source of light is Jesus. Verse 12, and again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And again, this again picks up from where we left off at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And uh, again, it's this amazing timing where things were growing dark, and Jesus stands up and says that he is the light of the world. But this is a loaded statement. Because he said, I am the light of the world. This is one of the seven I am statements that are associated with uh, an addition of talking about the character of God. We remember in John chapter 6, verse 35, he said, I am the bread of life. And that word I am, of course, is uh, ego me in the Greek, but he was not speaking Greek. Right? He's talking to Jews in the temple. And he's using the personal name for God, Yahweh. 
And that's what I am is translated in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, at the burning bush, when Moses said, who do you say, uh, who shall I say sent me? And from the bush, God said, tell him I am sent you. And here is Jesus saying, I am Yahweh, who is the light of the world. And this is where he talked about again, and he will say that I am the good shepherd. Again, the I am statements. I am the resurrection, the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All of these I am statements. And when you see capital L-O-R-D in your Bible, remember that is the personal name of God, Yahweh, that the Jews thought was too holy and it was disrespectful to write it, so they just put L-O-R-D. So when you see that in your Bible, that's what it means. It's actually Yahweh. And there's many more I am statements that we'll even see in this passage. But what he says is, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be God. Not just from the I am statement, but just saying that he is the light of the world. Why? God is light. 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 5. God is light. In the Gospel of John, it's used tw- light is used 24 times. But it's also known, even from the Old Testament, that the Messiah was going to be the light of the world. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6 and, and 9, it's talking about the Messiah being what? The light of the nations. And then in chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 and 20, it says, the sun, predicting what's going to happen at the end time, the sun shall be no more as your light of the day, nor brightness shall give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. So here Jesus saying that I am the light of the world is again, it's a fulfillment of prophecy where they expected that God is going to be the light and he is the light. And then when you even look at Revelation, we learn that Jesus is the light, that there's not going to be um, any need for the sun or moon to give, to give uh, light, but it's the Lamb of God who is the lamp and light of the world. And so, unlike the temporary lights that exist, he's an eternal light. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Again, just as Israel followed God, who represented himself as a, as a bright Shekinah cloud during the day and a pillar of fire, a light at night, he guided them and directed them throughout the wilderness and provided for them. So they followed the light. And just as they, Israel did during the Exodus, Jesus is saying here, follow me and you will not walk in darkness. So whoever follows him will have the light. But the word follow is sometimes uh, referred to just simply following, but in this context, it means more. It means submission. It means dedicating yourself to him. It's, it's committing wholeheartedly to Christ. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, this is what the idea of submission. He said that if anyone wishes to come after me, follow him, what do you have to do? Oh, you must deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake is the one who will save it. So we have to deny ourselves. That's the following of, of Christ. Denying our selfish ambitions and directions and guidance and wisdom and following Christ and and trusting in Him. And you will not walk in darkness. This this contrast between light and darkness exists throughout the Bible. And we find that, that darkness represents falsehood. And light represents truth. You'll find that darkness represents ignorance. And light represents God's wisdom. You'll find that darkness represents sin, and light represents God's uh, purity and holiness. You'll find that darkness represents despair, and light represents joy. You'll also find that that the one who follows him, and, and the most important one, is that darkness represents death, and light represents life. So the one who follows him will not walk in darkness. You won't be left groping in the dark, searching for answers. What's the purpose of life? 
What's going to happen when I die? All of those things are answered when you have the light and follow the light. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, speaking of Christ, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, who is a light. Upon salvation, you are transported from darkness, living in darkness and ignorance and death, and transported and transferred into the kingdom of Christ, which is light. You have light. You have illumination. You know things that you never knew before. For me, I, I liken when I was living in darkness, it's like seen in two dimensions, and when you come to Christ, it's like seen in three dimensions. You have understanding that you never had before. At night during the summer, I like to uh, kind of take a quick uh, plunge in the pool just to kind of cool off. But when I sit there in the, in the dark, I look up and I see stars. Not as many as you mountain folk, but I still see stars. And I just think about that. What do they represent? God's beauty, His majesty. His power, thinking about the billions of light years away they are from each other. But also God's gracious provision. What have stars done for us over the, the, the years? It's how people have navigated. And they know where to go because of the, of the stars, the pattern of the, of the stars. It's in the pool and I, I see the trees. A tree is just not a tree. You think about it. And you think, how kind is God? The trees give oxygen, and they take harmful carbon monoxide from the atmosphere, and it produces air for us to breathe as God's provision. And I hear the humming of the air conditioner. I think, how good is God to have cool air? How did that happen? Well, he deposited energy in the earth for us to, to tap and resource that, that fuel the, the power plants that provide the, the energy for us to cool. You see things completely differently when you have the light of the world. It's a whole different way of looking at life, understanding life, why you're here, where are you going, what's the purpose of life, all of those things are revealed when we follow light. And Jesus is the source of light, the only hope for sinners living in darkness. Now, we find the religious leaders rejecting Jesus. And so, Jesus then provides the witnesses of the light. Verse 13, So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So we have the Pharisees here. He's saying, I am the light. I am Yahweh. I'm God. And I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're bearing witness about yourself. You're just saying this. Why should we believe you? Who are you that we should trust you? They absolutely refused to consider the possibility of what Jesus was saying was true. And they're kind of relying on the Old Testament law where someone needs two or three witnesses to establish something as a fact. So Jesus knew that. And he answers in verse 14, and Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself... My testimony is true, for I know where I came from, where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from, and you don't know where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. So Jesus kind of answers their, their rejection and uh, dismissal of him by saying, I've got witnesses. First of all, I'm not a man. I'm God. I have divine authority to say what I'm saying, and God cannot lie. So he's first saying that what he's uh, establishing his divine origin, saying, 
I, well, you don't know where I came from or where I'm going. He's talking about heaven, having a divine origin in heaven. He said, you judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging according to the flesh. I'm not saying this according to the flesh. I'm saying this as, as a divine being, God. And so we know that he, heaven was his, was his throne. That was his origin. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality as a thing of God, uh, with God to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. His origin is heaven. He's God incarnate and possesses all knowledge. And it's based on him being God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, with all knowledge, that he's saying what he's saying. He's not judging according to earthly standards. As man, what is he talking about here? I mean, you, you, you judge according to the flesh. You're limited. You don't know anything. He's God. He knows everything. His judgment was not superficial, limited, uh, tainted with sin. That's, our, that's all every human's judgment. We're all tainted. And so he says that, and then he says that additionally, he's got another witness. Verse 16, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it's written the testimony of two people is true. I am one of the witnesses who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So he said, I got another witness. It's God the Father. So you have God the Son, and you have God the Father as the witnesses. In perfect agreement with the Son, the Father sent the Son to bear witness of who he is. And again, he's... The Pharisees are not, not understanding this. He's not, they didn't understand. He's talking about a God the Father. And they said to him, where is your father? Verse 19. So they were thinking purely on worldly terms and fleshly terms. Not understanding that he was talking about his God the Father. And it, many commentators think that they were kind of like mocking him. Like, who's your father? Knowing the rumors and the reports that, that uh, his mother was uh, pregnant while betrothed. So there's always this rumor, this scandal that he was an illegitimate son. So here the Pharisees could be mocking him saying, yeah, who, who, who's your father? They believe it's all earthly. And so Jesus' reply was, was biting and penetrating. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So here you have a situation where he basically says, uh, you're ignorant about these things. You're rejecting me because you don't know the father. You may, you're religious and you, you live your life thinking that you know God, but you don't know God. In John chapter 14, verse 7, he, he used a, the, a similar thing. He said, if you had known me, you would know my father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. And then Philip said to him, Lord, show us your father and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And so in the final analysis here, he was supported by the witness of God the Father. But all along, these religious leaders knew that it wasn't just Jesus saying this. You could go back to John the Baptist. You have another witness. We're saying John chapter 1, verse, verse uh, 6 and 8. There was a man sent by God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all may believe in him. And he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light who um, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So you had the witness of John the Baptist, and they knew John the Baptist. He was, he was one of the most popular people in, in Jerusalem, in Judea at that time. And then you have the testimony, the witness of the miracles that he performed. They knew that he was performing miracles. This was not, he just didn't appear in the temple and they didn't know who this person was. They knew that he had been around and he was performing all of these miracles. And so the miracles bear witness of who he is. In John chapter 5, verse 36, it says, But the testimony I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father sent me. So the works he's talking about are the miracles that he's performed these miracles. And then you have the witness of scriptures. You have the witness of scriptures. In chapter 5, verse 39, it says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. There's over 300 uh, Old Testament prophecies that talk about Jesus. Exactly where he was going to be born, what was going to happen to him, that he was going to die uh, on the cross, and just all the different things in his life, they're all revealed in the Old Testament. And so the scriptures are another witness. So you have five witnesses. Not just one, you have five witnesses about who he is. And so let me ask you, have you put your faith and trust in him? What is holding you back in light of all that you have heard and known about Christ? If anyone has not put their faith and trust in him, why? See, there's a couple reasons we can ascertain. And that is, well, <clears throat> we're trusting ourselves. We're putting too much trust in ourselves. And the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can't trust ourselves. We're, we're, we're tainted. Again, our, our, our knowledge is, is limited. We're not impartial. We, we shouldn't follow our hearts on things like the movies tell us. Instead, as the Right of Proverbs said is trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. And we should trust the word of God. It's been tested. There are things in the in the word of God that that scientists are now only showing that are that's true. The things that are re revealed in scripture, there's there's everything uh, when they say something that happened historically, the archaeologists say that doesn't, didn't happen, and then a few years later they said, oh, sorry, we found a, a discovery, and it proves exactly what the Bible says over and over again. We need to trust that. The scriptures are true. So, what is holding you back? Why well, haven't put your faith and trust in him? So, the Pharisees Religious leaders did not. They rejected him. Even after saying that he had these witnesses, they just didn't understand. And so we see a, a mixed response from this. And we, so we see in, ver, in um, the third point, the rejection and acceptance of Jesus as the light of the world. First, the, the rejection. We f see the rejection. The reason for that rejection is hard-heartedness. Verse 21. <clears throat> And he said to them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come? So Jesus gives a very dire, sober warning about those who reject him. He said, you're going to die. You're going to die in your sin. And he had, this is something that he had repeated, that where he's going, they can't come. He, he's going to heaven, but they're not going to heaven. And here you have this, this situation where they're saying he's go, uh, where he's going, they can't come. And they understood. Uh, he, he's talking about death. Uh, but the way they interpreted this was a callous joke, thinking, 
Ah, is he going to kill himself? He's going to commit suicide. That's what they were thinking. And why is that? Because they believe that those who commit suicide go to the deepest part of hell. Josephus, a Jewish historian in the first century, wrote, The souls of those whose hands have acted madly against themselves are received in the darkest place of Hades. So they believe that he, they were kind of like he's saying, where I'm going, you can't come. They thought it's death, and he's going to kill himself, and he's going to go to hell. So we're not going to see him because he's going to hell, and, and we're going to heaven. That was their interpretation. They got it completely backwards. It's actually flipped entirely a different way. So they, <coughs> they rejected that. They were absolutely oblivious to the truth that Jesus was saying and the warning that Jesus was giving them. But then we find another reason for this rejection. In verse 23, Jesus said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of the world, I am not of the world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So again, he's being very clear. They were, they were uncertain, they didn't understand, and so he comes back at them again, and he gives the reason why they are not believing and why they're going to die in their sins. Because they are from below, they are of the world, they are in the fallen world. So worldliness, being of the world. This is the world, the word for world is cosmos, and it has different connotations, but mostly the way that it's used in John, it's talking about a fallen spiritual system that opposes the kingdom of God. In John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus says that Satan is the God of this world. That it's the religious, the, the, the political systems, the religious systems that exist in this world are, are all fallen. Jesus said that those of the world love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. All those in the world. John chapter 3, verse 19. And Paul ex kind of expands on this by saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in the case the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of all unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So they're in darkness. They're following the, the God of this world. Later, in John, John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James says in James chapter 4, verse 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's what Jesus is saying. They were of the world. You even have the parable of the sower and the seed, where there was a seed that was that was uh, planted, but there were thorns that choked out the, the seed, right? So what was Jesus' interpretation of those thorns in Matthew chapter 13? Verse 33 says, For what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word, and it proves to be unfruitful. So that consequence is unbelief and death. He said, I told you that you were going to die in your sins unless you believe that what? I am he. Yahweh, once again, saying the personal name of God, that I am he. It's another I am statement. Jesus is affirming his, his deity here. And unless you believe that Jesus is God, you are going to die. That's what he's saying very clearly. It's belief in him that he is God incarnate. You don't believe that? You're living outside the sphere of salvation. You will, you will die in your sins. So being of the world and loving the world prevents people from accepting Christ. 
You remember the young rich ruler, right? Came to heaven, how, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh, to obey all the commandments. And the young ruler thought, great, I've done that. That's what I do. I obey. And she said, great, sell everything and follow me. And he goes, oh, well, not that. Not that. He loved the world. He loved his possessions. And so possessions, the love of possessions, keep people from believing in Christ. How many times have you encountered people who say, I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I know, but I'm just not ready. I'm not ready to commit to Christ. I'm not ready to follow him. Why do they say that? Because they love the world. They're not re- ready to release their grip on the things of the world to follow Christ. And they th- have all of these things that they, they think they're going to have to give up this and give up that and, and uh, live kind of a, 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 a miserable life being a Christian. Uh, for the furthest thing from the truth. You have joy, you have peace you ha- that you've never experienced before, and you just let go of those things. You don't even realize that you let go of those things. Just, God just gives you a desire for, to grab onto Him instead of those things. But it takes submission for that. Then we continue, and we see another reason is ignorance. Verse 25, and so they said to them, who are you? These are the Pharisees, the religious people are, are telling, asking Jesus. So they said to him, who are you? And Jesus answered them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say to you about um, uh, and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare the world that I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. In light of all that's happened, all he said, all the miracles, they say, who are you? And I said, I've been telling you from the very beginning who I am. I I really have nothing more to tell you. If if you don't believe now, based on everything that you've seen and heard, there's nothing that I'm going to tell you that you're going to make you believe me. They had no ears for him to hear the truth about who he is. So, some people just don't want to hear about Christ. They want to remain ignorant. They want to believe what they believe about God. They, they create a God of their own imagination. One who's not going to judge them. One who's going to give them what they desire. And they're creating a God in their own image. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones passed away a number of years ago, wrote of the people who believe this, their God is something which they created themselves, a being who is always prepared to oblige and excuse them. They do not worship him uh, with awe and respect. Indeed, they do not worship him at all. They reveal their so-called God is no God at all in their talk, for they forever are saying they simply cannot believe God will punish the unrepentant sinner to all eternity and this and that. They cannot believe that God will do so, therefore they draw their own conclusion that God does not and will not. In other words, God does what they believe he ought to do not or, or not do. What a false and blasphemous conception of God, how utterly untrue and unworthy such is the paganism of today. So, those are the, those who reject Christ. They choose to remain ignorant. They, they, they suppress the truth and exchange it for a lie, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 1. But then we see that there are certain people that accept Christ. Verse 28. So Jesus said to them, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and He who sent me is with me, and have not left me alone, for I always do the things that is pleasing to Him. And He was saying these things, and many believed in Him. So Jesus said that when you lift up the Son of Man, that's again referring to His crucifixion, and by implication also His what? His resurrection and ascension. 
And you also have here another what? I am statement. He says, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that what? I am He. Yahweh. Again, that He is Yahweh. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that He is Yahweh God. And so, people will know certain things about Christ from the cross. Now, the cross is how we can possibly know certain things about God and Christ that we would never know before. And he said he spoke these things to prove that uh, the Father ta- taught him and he uh, was with the Father and the Father would not leave him alone and he was doing all that the Father told him because this was the plan of salvation. He was being obedient to God the Father in the plan of salvation. He always did things that are pleasing to the Father. So, what is going on here? Well, if, when he's lifted up, ultimately, right, that's when people are going to see that he rose from the dead. So many more people will be saved. And when he's ascended, what's going to happen? Many of the people who are rejecting him are ultimately, a lot of them are going to be saved because 3,000 Jews were saved at Pentecost six months later. Well, excuse me, it's, uh, This is happening six months before the crucifixion. So they will know him because the cross, I mean, it's a symbol for Christianity, right? When, if it's not a dove, it's not a dove, right? If it were a dove, people would see a bird and they'll think, well, what type of bird is that? Is it a pigeon? I don't know. But when you see the cross, (laughs) you'd be far from across the room and well that represents Christ it represents Christ it represents what he needed to do to save us it 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 shows that we're sinners and our sin had to be dealt with that our rebellious nature willful nature was was overcome by the cross That barrier between us and God was dealt with at the cross. And the cross reveals things about God. And the word that lifted up, in Greek, there's a common word for lifted up called arrow, but that's not what is used here. The word that's used here is a word that's used to uh, mostly for exalt. So when Christ is exalted, then you will know that he is who he says he is. In John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus, high priestly prayer, he said, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, it was crucifixion, glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. So he's talking about the God the Father is glorified through the cross. How how is that revealed? The cross shows God's love for you. That we are sinners, we're separated from God, we're in darkness, and the cross makes it possible for us to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light of, of Jesus. The cross shows that God loves us even in our sinful state so much that he was willing to die for us and take the penalty that we deserve so that we could have everlasting life. The cross makes it possible for God to love you. He would not be able to love you if your sin wasn't dealt with. So the cross makes it possible for you to be eternally loved, eternally loved, forever and ever, always loved by the Father. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You are eternally always loved, no matter what you've done. On your worst day, you are eternally loved because it's based on what Christ has done for you. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. 
trust in him. Believe in him. He loves you and has died for you. We're going to have the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper represents God's love for you. It represents the sacrifices that he made for you. The, the body that was sacrificed for you. The blood that was shed for you is represented in the Jews. So when we have communion, it's really just a, a form of worshiping him and thanking him for his great sacrifice. It's also a time for us to, to reflect and think, is there, is there a barrier between us and God? Is there something that I need to confess? Is there a barrier between me and my, my brother and my sister who are part of the body of Christ? So is there, is there something that I need to confess? Is there someone that I need to be reconciled with to make things right? And also, it looks forward to the time that we're going to be with God forever at his table. So, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, oh, and communion is for believers, so if you have put your faith and trust in Christ, then you are welcome to take it. If you have not, then, then it has no uh, benefit for you, and that we trust the uh, parents to determine whether their children take communion. As Paul said, for I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the wafer. <clears throat> In the same way, he uh, also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup. Please stand as we worship the Lord. second chance how good is he when a sinner's heart is all that I can bring still he welcomes me how good is he Bye. 
never did another thing for me. He's all I'll ever need. How good is he? Well, it was wonderful worshiping with all of you. And if there is someone who has not put their faith and trust in Jesus, um, that he has uh, died on the cross for your sin and he rose on the third day and ascended to heaven, then we'd love to talk to you about that and share through the gospel how you can be saved and have eternal life and be loved eternally by God the Father. Paul writes, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. You are loved.